Well, yeah, there's welcome, a little, Greg. A little side story about that, actually. There's two checkpoints out there. Uh, one of us makes firewalls. The other one makes retail security systems. So technically, we are checkpoint two words, uh, not checkpoint one words. But let's be honest. You guys probably know us as the firewall guys. Right? We make firewalls, although I must admit, we do a lot more than just firewalls these days as well. Having been in the industry for over 24 years now, we're really a security company who happens to make firewalls. But that being the case, if you look at today's environments out there, many customers out there are trying to figure out, do we continue to invest money in our physical data centers, or do we start to lift and shift these workloads and move them to the cloud? Now, I bet if I was to poll the audience and ask who has some type of a cloud initiative going on, most, if not all, of the hands are going to raise here in the room. Now, the reasons for that might be slightly different depending upon what your organizational drivers are. For some people, it's the ability to move faster. For some people, it's the ability to reduce the amount of cost. However, Regardless of the reason why your organization is lifting and shifting and moving application workloads to the cloud, security is a top of mind. Let's be honest. It's been a very busy year the last few years in the information security space. Heck, just look at the last few weeks with ransomware proliferating all around the internet, probably impacting every one of the organizations in this room right here. And the truth of the matter is that there's probably not a single IT project going on inside of your organization where security is not a consideration. Now, that doesn't mean it should be the number one consideration, although as a security vendor, I would argue, why carry on any type of an IT project if security is not a foundational element within the infrastructure? Now, we talked a little bit about cloud. Why are people moving to cloud? other than it being the trendy thing to do, and as one of my customers said, well, the reason we're moving to cloud is because our CISO wants to be in the cover of a magazine. So hopefully your reasons for moving cloud are not just about getting someone on the cover of a magazine, although that's a very nice goal, but many of our customers are really just looking to move faster. Let's be honest. The amount of time that it takes in a traditional data center to deploy servers, storage, software, security, networking, takes too long. And as a result of that, our application and our developers are saying goodbye. They're saying goodbye to us. They're leaving behind the traditional server storage, application security networking folks, and they're lifting and shifting and moving these applications to the cloud. They're saying, I can do in days and weeks what previously was taking you months. The other key driver that we see for many people moving out to cloud is elasticity. Many of our businesses have peak events that in the past we have bought infrastructure to support that once a week, once a month, or once a quarter, or once a year type event for peak load. And that peak load is often five and ten times our average normal runtime. However, we only use it for a couple of days and weeks a year and we're over-provisioning server storage networking, security, and all of these other tools in order to handle that quarter-end event, that biannual sale, the promotion, the marketing, the Super Bowl event. And is the elasticity that cloud represents, the ability to scale up and scale down, the ability to go faster and slower at the same time, that's really driving people to go to cloud. However, who in this room would feel comfortable moving an application, connecting the internet, and really just providing some basic access control lists and calling that an adequate security? Probably not very many of you. And I think this is the ebb and flow that many of you are facing today is we want to move to cloud. We want to move faster. We want to enable self-service and automation and orchestration. And cloud is a great opportunity, let's be honest, to start from scratch. You don't always get to bring with you a lot of your tools, systems, servers, storage, and networking. And you get to take advantage of all of the great things that Amazon, Azure, Google, and other cloud providers have to offer. However, in order for you to capitalize on these new capabilities, we have to do things slightly differently. Cloud is not the place to lift and shift our legacy infrastructure in a like-for-like -like fashion and move it into the cloud itself. 
Now, many of us may be looking to enhance our investments in the physical data center, bringing forth technologies like software-defined networking as one step to enabling this level of agility and automation and orchestration. And I will state that for those of you who are making the investments, whether it's with VMware, Cisco, OpenStack, or other SDN providers out there, these are great investments in your infrastructure. And they represent an incremental opportunity for you to not just augment the agility of your data center, but augment the insertion of security into that data center as well. However, when we talk about what's happening in the application world and we look at the DevOps world, well, these guys want to go fast. They want to go so fast that they often don't care about bringing the information security folks along with them. And these are the people inside your organization who believe that cloud is natively secure. Who thinks the cloud is secure out of the box? Probably nobody. That doesn't mean that they don't have good security, but that doesn't mean that people like us shouldn't augment the native security controls that are built in the cloud. And it really starts first and foremost at the edge. Kind of like I joked before, no one in this room would deploy applications to the internet, stick them in their physical data center, and eliminate the firewalls and the IPS and the DDoS and the proxies and the load balancers and the SSL termination devices and all the infrastructure that you've purchased. In the cloud, we have to be able to do the same thing. We have to start at the edge and first and foremost, look on the outside. But most importantly, is that the security has to be able to be deployed in the same DevOps way as the application itself. That means no human should touch the security. The deployment should be fully automated and orchestrated. It should have the ability to scale out and scale up, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. How do we take advantage of the native cloud tools to deliver these capabilities? But the key here in the DevOps world is that people expect these things to be deployed right away. Seconds, minutes, maybe an hour. Definitely not days and definitely not weeks. And the key here is that once we've deployed it the first time, the security, much like the application, should be able to scale up and scale out without anyone on an infrastructure team from logging in on their laptop and having to kick off a batch script, a process, click a box in a web interface console, or use some other management tool to enable the security to scale up and scale out in the same exact way. And in order to do that, we have to learn how to take advantage of the native cloud tools and techniques to deploy. And when we look at customers today that are faced with the question, do we invest in SDN and enhance our data center, or do we stop investing in the data center and move into the public cloud itself? Now, I can tell you both from my talking with customers for the last 10 years, as well as talking with many of you in the room over the last few hours, is that different businesses and different applications have a different answer to this. Right? If I'm a healthcare company with an electronic medical record system, those are probably not the primary applications that I'm looking to move out to Amazon and Azure. Equally, if I'm a large financial services or credit card processor or insurance company that still has a lot of big iron behind the scenes, well, I may lift and shift some of those workloads and applications to the public cloud. But let's be honest, my mainframe, my large scale databases that are still running on legacy non-X86 platforms, they may not be the right ones to go ahead and lift and shift and move into the public cloud. Now, even if we do move some of these applications into Amazon, Azure, or somewhere else, a lot of times these applications that live in the public cloud, well, they still have to connect and talk to applications in the private cloud. So therefore, even though we're moving many workloads and applications out to Amazon, Azure, Google, Rackspace, and others out there, there still needs to be connectivity and security across both of them. And I think from an information security perspective, this is both the challenge and the opportunity that we have today. And that we have a new opportunity to help our customers secure their infrastructure and take advantage of some of these software-defined capabilities and decouple ourselves from the boxes. Now, I'll be the first to admit it. We sell boxes. We sell appliances. and. They've got fast interfaces and 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, and 100 gig. But when you shift into the cloud, none of that matters. <clears throat> you don't get to bring them along with you. <clears throat> now, what you do get to bring along with you 
are the choice of tools that you choose to implement. Now, within the private cloud, you have a lot more flexibility and choice. I might be using Cisco ACI, VMware, Puppet Chef, Ansible. There's a variety of orchestration tools <coughs> that will plug in as well. And it's the orchestrators now that are actually in a very unique position. And why that's the case is the orchestrators are now feeding information southbound into the controllers, the networking controllers, the security controllers, the compute controllers as well. However, when we start to move into the public cloud, <coughs> a lot of these things come together. We natively start to use the Amazon networking controller, the Amazon compute manager. We use their APIs from an automation and orchestration. However, you may choose to use Puppet, Chef, Ansible, VRO, VRA, Cisco Clicker, BMC, HP, many vendors out there have solutions that are responsible for automation and orchestration. The key here is understanding which one of these solutions can integrate and interoperate with the other investments that you've already made. Here's the dirty secret. There's a lot of good technology out there. Us, even our competitors have some good technology out there. However, if we are not interoperable, with the investments that you've already made, myself or my competitors will have no place in your organization for the next three to five years. It's the interoperability of these technologies which represents the newest best of breed, and not necessarily which vendor's data sheet tells you we're the fastest, or we have the most signatures, or we have the best catch rates, or we have the most elastic and scalable security solutions out there. Because to be honest, if you listen to these vendors' marketing departments, we all have the best, fastest, most secure technology out there. Now let's look at some of these use cases where in the past, security used to be manually provisioned. We would deploy the firewalls, we'd manage the firewall policies, people do some application deployment. But there are many of these tasks that previously were done in a manual way. And in order to embrace automation and orchestration, we have to be, able to be able to break these tasks down into multiple small pieces. As someone said to me, if I do something three times, Greg, I expect my team to write a script and automate that task. If we do many tasks in a row in a continuous process, I expect them to orchestrate that workflow. So if we think about a very simple one about maybe the web servers, we've added some new web servers. Well, in the past, that led to a very long and lengthy ticket process. We open the ticket, we fill out the paperwork, it goes in somebody's queue, and maybe on the next maintenance window, somebody will log in and change the firewalls. Well, it's this day and week long process that's literally causing our developers to say, goodbye InfoSec team, hello cloud, because I can do this faster without you. Well, the reality is, is that security can follow the same exact process. Well, what if your security dynamically learned from Amazon, Azure, VMware, or other cloud providers about changes within the virtual fabric and then real-time updated the security policies without an analyst like myself from logging into a console and manually making a change? Well, what about the scale-up events? This is another very classic use case. We start with a small application in a pre-prod and non-prod workload. Next thing you know, we publish this application and go production and the performance requirements go through the roof. So maybe people are adding more web servers. Maybe they're modifying the load balancers to add more into the group. Maybe they've changed it from running on smaller VMs to much larger scale virtual machines. So the entire application stack changes completely. Well, I can assure you those application owners do not want to wait for the firewall guys, the InfoSec team, to log into the console, make a bunch of changes. The expectation is that the automation and agility I have with cloud should permeate and work its way into the security itself. And this is what DevOps wants. So they want this tight integration. They want the automation. They want the ability to provision an entirely new application, including the compute, storage, and application, in addition to the networking and the security. And these blueprints are now being rolled out from these automation and orchestration engines and they're now being the ones pushing it into the security tools rather than the other way around. 
And as an information security professional, I've learned in the last 12 to 24 months that if we don't embrace a new way of thinking and a new way of doing things, we are going to get left behind. On its truth, our application folks are going to say goodbye, server storage, networking, and security folks. Hello, Amazon, Azure, and Google, and here we come. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that security has the ability to be deployed just as fast as cloud. And what started three and five years ago and 10 years ago as this migration to virtualization, where we now reduce the physical into a multi-context virtual world, second, now moving into the software-defined world. We hear a lot of talk about software-defined networking now as being the next evolution of the data center. But in reality, in phase three, DevOps is leaving behind phase one and phase two. The desire to deploy through code and manage everything through code, infrastructure to code, is taking over our organizations. The challenge is, is that the networking and security guys, to be honest, are the last to get on this bandwagon. They're the last to find out about it and the last to make this change. However, as a security vendor, we realize the opposite has to be the case. Security must be an enabler for migration to the cloud, or else it will become the anchor dragging the boat down a little bit. So how do we help customers enable security to move at the speed of DevOps? Well, first and foremost, we have to realize that the deployment of security is done differently. There's a lot of new terms and technology that we have to learn, and your server guys, they speak this language. And for those of you who are in the application development world, using templates, and whether they're CloudFormation in Amazon, ARM templates in Azure, we're using heat YAML templates within our OpenStack deployment, or even creating vApps within VMware, there are many different ways to do the same exact thing. Is automate the deployment of this type of a recipe, and not just deploy the technology and then deploy the security, but there are two and three other steps that have to take place as well. We need to create the policy. Who is gonna be responsible for creating that? Somebody sitting in a corner in a cube? Probably not. It's more likely the same automation tool that's deploying the security is also now responsible for creating the policies themselves. The third step is potentially the creation of security tags and other pieces of metadata that our application folks are used to using out of the box. Well, I'm going to tell you first and foremost that your security vendors as well should be able to utilize and consume security tags and security groups and dynamically enforce policy based upon the metadata that our application owners are putting onto the virtual machines. Rather than waiting for someone to give us an update, a change of status request, and have us manually manage and manipulate the security policies. The last thing around automation, and this is probably one of the most important and challenging things about cloud, is who is allowed to manage and manipulate the software-defined network. And I don't care if this is VMware NSX, Cisco ACI, the native SDN controller built into Amazon or Azure. However, the ability to have the SDN controller steer traffic in and out of security is the primary, let me say it differently, it is the only mechanism out there for chaining security together. And when I talk about chaining the security together, what I'm really talking about is how do you take someone's solution, could be Checkpoint, could be Cisco, could be Fortinet, Pan, or anybody else, and how do I insert it into the software-defined data center? At minimum, protecting the perimeter. Right? We have to look at the north to south edge. However, more importantly for customers is how do we look inside the environment? How do we prevent the horizontal propagation of infection from spreading wholesale across our environment? Too many of our customers still have the hard, crunchy outside and the soft, chewy inside. And worse yet, when we move to Amazon, Azure, and Google, we're doing the same exact thing. We're setting up some basic perimeter firewall rules, let port 80 and 443 in the web zone, but we're not bringing forth next generation firewalls and threat prevention, let alone the intra-environment access controls and threat prevention. Now, I was talking earlier in my session, and the comment came up, well, cloud enables new levels of scale in and scale out. 
Except what you have to understand is that we're all playing by the same exact rules. So on one hand, we talk about vertically scaling a solution. This is like buying a bigger firewall. Well, let's face it, Amazon and Azure have nearly limitless compute resources out there. However, what you don't understand, though, or you may understand, is that every instance type is rate limited based upon the cloud provider. So for example, if I'm on a two-core web server or two-core firewall, that can do about 500 mega throughput. If I go all the way up to a 16-core instance in Amazon, I can get two gig worth of throughput. Well, how do you get to a 10 gig firewall in the cloud since none of these images natively are going to give you 10 gig of throughput? Well, the answer is we have to think differently. It's no longer about 10 by one, it's about one by 10. It's about taking many small instances and grouping them together. Now, our application folks get this. They've been using horizontally scaling clustering for many years. Firewalls behind load balancers is one such example. So we use that same exact approach in the cloud to allow these auto-scaling groups to deploy the security. And this can be for ingress or egress. This can be to protect north, south, and east to west. But what it allows you is now a active, active load sharing <coughs> across many members rather than one firewall or one IDS or one IPS trying to do it all. Now we could probably talk about the load sharing and the scalability of cloud for a few hours, and I only have about eight minutes left. So the key takeaway here is that the security has the same scale out and scale up as your application. As a matter of fact, we use the same auto-scaling groups, elastic load balancers, CloudWatch, and auto-scaling templates as your web servers and your application servers might be. So the key is that security has to use <coughs> the native cloud capabilities for scale up and scale out. The second thing I really want to point out here is that ability to deploy through code. Look, we've always had a very fancy console. It's one of the reasons people like our management utility. That's why Gartner continues to call us the gold standard of industry security management. However, in today's world, <coughs> we have to have new ways of doing things. And it has to be driven through APIs. And it doesn't matter if I want to stick up my application and stick it on a container and manage it with Docker or Kubernetes. It doesn't really matter. Or if I want to natively use web services to plug into my management platform or use a third-party tool like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, AlgoSec, Fireman, Tufin, there's many good products out there, many of which you guys are probably already using. Again, it's about the interoperability. If my infrastructure doesn't work with the investments you've already made, it's probably not too likely that you're going to want to continue upon our relationship. So let me try and summarize what we take with our customers and talk about the four steps to securing cloud. First and foremost, just like in our physical data center, it starts at the edge. We have to have visibility on the outside. We have to be able to provide not just basic firewalling functionality, but the layers of advanced threat prevention as well. As we've all seen, the risks on the internet are increasing exponentially. And just as if none of us would feel comfortable deploying an application in our physical data center without traditional border controls, whether they're firewall, DDoS, DLP, threat mitigation, but also, we should be securely connecting to the cloud as well. We should be encrypting our data in motion. We should be securely connecting across an express route or direct connect. And though carrier links are encapsulated, remember, MPLS is not encrypted. So protecting your data in motion is pivotal whether you go through the front door or come through the back. <coughs> Step two is we have to secure ourselves from ourselves. We have to deploy some type of an internal segmentation such that all these shared environments do not allow one very small infection of a host to lead to a very large infection of the entirety of the data center. And this doesn't matter if it's inside your physical four walls or if this is inside of the public cloud as well. Having not just perimeter north to south, but internal east to west controls, no matter whose vendor you choose, is pivotal. We have to be able to secure and segment inside the network just as much as we do outside the network. There have been dozens of use cases over the last few years about infections of organizations that started as a very small breach and resulted in millions of credit card records 
being exfiltrated from the organization. And mind you, some of these companies who were compromised had InfoSec budgets, had every single tool known to mankind. However, they weren't properly deployed inside the environment to prevent the infection and to prevent the propagation of the infection once it got inside the organization. I think probably one of the most important portions that we like to talk with customers about is how do you effectively manage both sides with consistency in terms of policy, logging, and visibility. Again, there's a lot of very good technology out there. My company and even some of my competitors' technology out there. But for you as an organization, there's only so many people on your team, there's only so many hours in the day, and there's only so much budget that the business is going to offer you to manage and maintain and secure your infrastructure. So if your organization is now managing one set of tools for Amazon, a second set of tools for Azure, a third set of tools for VMware as an example, and now you're trying to get unified visibility, well, you know what's coming now? A fourth tool. Most of our customers out there are trying to figure out how do we reduce the amount of infrastructure that we have to own, manage, and maintain, yet increase the level of visibility and threat prevention capabilities. It's only by choosing scalable platforms that are flexible, dynamic, and where and how they can deploy that allows an organization to figure out what are the best tools that I need to use. It could be me. It could be one of my competitors. It could be something else altogether. But for you sitting in those chair, how do I make sure, maintain the visibility and security across both my public and my private cloud? Because to be honest, we're all going to be going back and forth and back and forth between applications that live in my physical, move to the virtual, and maybe even boomerang and come back around. The fourth one is really around that automation and orchestration. And for the InfoSec folks, this is hard. We are not used to this level of agility and automation and orchestration. This is something the application guys have been doing to automatically provision, automatically scale, and automatically change the policies around. What I'm here to tell you, though, is that security has the same level of flexibility, automation, and orchestration, and openness to integrate with a variety of cloud and automation tools. So whether you're looking at the traditional server DevOps tools like Puppet Chef and Ansible, maybe you're using an InfoSec automation tool like Firemon, Tufin, or Augosec, or heck, maybe you just got a bunch of smart people that wrote a bunch of Python scripts yourselves, you have to have the ability to fully automate and orchestrate those cloud deployments. And that's how security can move at the speed of DevOps, right? By having a security solution that lives on both sides, that lives in VMware and in Hyper-V, that works with the commercial SDN solution and also works with the OpenStack and allows you to now lift and shift security, move it to Amazon, Azure, Google, or other, and still maintain the sem same semblance of enterprise security visibility and access control. The second key to really enabling security at the speed of DevOps is to trust DevOps, is to build security solutions that allow me to learn from these cloud providers about changes that happen automatically in the environment and allow those changes to real-time update the security infrastructure at the same exact time that those applications are being deployed. And lastly, and the reason why people continue to deploy security is for the visibility. It's to be able to see what's going on is the ability to break glass if and when we need it. I'm not sitting here saying every one of your organizations needs to have a Fort Knox and an NSA security footprint from day one. However, there may be a time in the future where you guys need to crank it up a notch, go from a one to a two to a five to a 10. By building the right security tools into the environment from day one, it gives you the ability to increase incrementally the protection level on demand without having to go ahead and redeploy your entire application environment. I really appreciate you all taking time with me this afternoon, joining us here at the conference and spending a couple of days with us. Thank you very much for listening to my session. We look forward to opportunities to talk with each one of you about how Checkpoint can help you secure your cloud migration. Thanks and have a great day. Any questions for Greg? I'd be happy to take a question or two if there's anything from yes. the audience. Mr. Javadi.
Hi, uh, Greg. Mark Giovanni. I'm with at and um, Question I have is uh, for organizations that they have not yet adapted the SD-WAN mm -hmm. technology or, or the uh, like AWS or the cloud providers, mm -hmm. do they have a best practice or recipe for the division of security responsibilities between them and the, the basically the customers? And is there something documented that uh, companies can follow, again, being in best practice and so yeah. forth? Are you talking more about the shared responsibility between the cloud, the carrier, and the customer? Yes, or the yeah shared responsibility within the customer's environment itself? It's mainly between the cloud providers like AWS sure. and also the customer. What is their responsibility versus what's our responsibility? Like you talked about uh, protecting the edges and so mm -hmm. forth, but probably a little bit more than that. I'm just wondering if something documented along those lines. Well, look, it is, it is a shared responsibility in the cloud. Amazon, Microsoft, they secure their infrastructure they inherently do not secure your data, your applications. And though they have connectivity to carriers to bring in those MPLS links or the direct connects and the express routes, I mean, that's just a carrier circuit like anyone else. No different than me going to level three, Megapath, or any of the other co-location providers as well. I think the biggest challenge in terms of the shared responsibility is understanding that we, you, us, all have shared responsibility. And therefore, when we move our applications and our data to the cloud, though there are some security controls built into the cloud, we should be able to augment these. As I like to use the analogy, most of us have driven in a car recently, and cars for many years have had seat belts. Now we have these additive security controls like airbags and anti-lock brakes and backup cameras, but we still wear our seat belts. So though we have new technologies, SD-WAN is a great example of it, it doesn't eliminate the basic shared responsibility for providing enterprise security controls. Now, being a security guy, I would argue that all of our carrier links, because it's a shared multi-tenant service provider, you should be encrypting your data. However, I know a lot of organizations that feel this express route and direct connect is a private link. There's no need to go in and do so. Well, the truth of the matter is when I'm talking to Citibank and J.P. Morgan Chase, it's probably different than when I'm talking to some other consumer products organization as well. Because I think the sensitivity of the data will determine what level of security controls we need to implement within the cloud or SD-WAN or any other virtualization project. So I hope I kind of touched on the, pro the challenge and opportunity a little bit, but the key takeaway is it's shared responsibility, and there is no one-size-fits-all. Any other questions? Yes, Maribel. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Okay, absolutely on board and agree that we need to um, secure the cloud, not just from what the cloud security vendors provide, right? Typically what happens with security though is we always end up layering another thing in. So in order to get this cloud security, are we adding another box, another service, does anything go away? How do we simplify this process of like the multi-layer security yeah. stack that we have? Well, look, you can still bring every one of the DDoS, firewall, WAF, proxy as an example, and deploy each one of those within the cloud itself. Although we are seeing a tremendous interest in the general consolidation. Now, does everything consolidate in one box? Not necessarily. However, I think the key is choosing what does your organization do well and continuing to do that and figure out what's the right platform for consolidation. I think the other thing to understand is in the physical world, we used to try and shove everything into one box because we invested a lot of money in that one device and I wanted to get every dollar out of that. I see too many people running active-active for that very reason. I bought two firewalls, I want to use them both. However, the cloud lets us take that one big problem and break it up into smaller pieces, these micro security services. So especially in terms of performance, elasticity, uh, separation of fault, isolation domains, there's many reasons that cloud allows us to now take what was a three, four, five vendor solution, maybe consolidate to one, two, or three vendors. However, I don't have to consolidate it all into one 
device. Because what I don't want to do is replicate the bottlenecks of the physical data center in the cloud itself. And that's where we have to embrace new ways of deployment. I talked a little bit about auto scale and deployment through code is one example. But that is one way in which we see customers now taking that three, four, five, six vendor solution down to maybe one, two, or three. Is there another? All right, yes, uh, this is uh, Pierre Boiron from uh, AVL Boeing. I have, I have a question. Uh, why, why do you think like Twitter, Twitter intelligence is so criti critical to like every organization? Sure. So th the question about threat intelligence and why is it critical? Um, first and foremost, there's a lot of great threat intel out there. Each vendor has their own threat intelligence, but if I can't take information from McAfee or CrowdStrike or iSight, we're not going to have as much intrinsic value to you out there. And as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, is the interoperability, threat indicator is a perfect example. Not just the ability to consume them, but let's say you presented to me a list of a million indicators. Well, let's say I'm already protecting against 990,000 of them. Well, don't you want to know the 10,000 that's the delta and be able to roll just those out as well? So it's really important on the threat intel side to be able to share information. Take my information and get it out and put it in another system so that they can now operationalize it. Equally, we have to be able to take threat intel, whether it's from commercial vendors, whether it's from the traditional you know, public safety, maybe the FBI or NSA provided threat intelligence, and consume it and operationalize on it. Threat intel is probably one of the most important areas of um, shared responsibility because no one vendor has the corner on good intelligence. And if some of my competitors, like FireEye, for example, has good intelligence, well, shouldn't we be able to consume that and filter it and block it on the edge rather than waiting for those packets to get three layers deep in the network where that vendor's tool can go ahead? And I think this is where, up until a few years ago, as information security vendors, we used to always claim to have the best threat intel, and I have the best catch rate, and I have the best numbers of signatures. But to be honest, nobody cares about that. Because if you listen to every one of the vendors, we all have the best. I have the most, it's the fastest, it's the most secure, how many would you like to buy? But at the end of the day, we have to be able to play nicely in the sandbox with the other tools that you've already invested in and consume them and operationalize them. So for example, we take Sticks Taxi indicators, we take Snort rules, we're part of McAfee's DXL. Right? There's many things that we've done to share threat intelligence both internally and externally, because there's a lot of good information out there, and why wouldn't we want to capitalize on that? 